The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Mark chapter 6. And as you're turning there, Nikki thanked uh, our volunteers for VBS, but I want us to thank Nikki for the hard work that she gave. I can make that happen this week. Um, She probably hates me for doing that, which is okay. Um, I hate that I missed it. It looked like it was a, a great deal of fun and makes me wish, don't know sometimes that VBS was more than just like for a few days in the summer. Unless, of course, you're working at VBS, then you're like, you know, one week is probably, probably fine. But Mark chapter 6, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 14, we'll read through verse 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guest, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, give us ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and not mine. Words that call us deeper and deeper into this life of faith. Your words that shape us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, just about every person who has ever worked, ever worked a menial job, I suspect has had the same sort of daydream at least once. Now, the job may have been different. Maybe he was a dishwasher at a big chain restaurant, scraping the shrimp shells off the plate at Red Lobster. Maybe she mopped the floor at the local grocery store. Maybe they took the drive through orders and salted the fries. But whatever the case, they likely, at one time or another, at least had the whole thing laid out in their minds. And they were just waiting for the right moment, just the right incident to set the whole thing into motion. I've worked one or two of those sorts of jobs, but I've had the fair share of hearing those stories, but never witnessing them firsthand but they all usually follow the same sort of pattern. Worker has been ridden hard by an unrelenting boss about something meaningless, like the direction they sweep the floor, the way they stock the shelves in the supply closet, until one day, until one day that worker has had enough, and they snap and begin telling the boss everything she thinks about him, lets him know how horrible he is, how much everyone really hates him, but nobody has the guts to tell him, It's usually a somewhat dramatic affair, and depending on who tells the story, it it usually ends one of two ways. 
Either everybody just sort of mumbles awkwardly back to work because, well, nobody else wants to get fired. Or someone slams the door and yells, I quit! And the whole place erupts in applause as the boss slinks back into his office, shamed by some fry cook who just called him out on his shortcoming. Those sorts of stories are the kind folks often like to hear when they're feeling a bit depressed or oppressed at work. They're sort of like truth to power stories, but they feel grounded in reality. Like there might be a small glimmer of hope for those of us who seem always to be on the unending side of misfortune. I mean, don't we like those kinds of stories? I mean, if we're honest... Don't we like a good story about some underdog speaking truth to power? A story about someone who stands up for what's right in the face of dire consequences. Whether it's a story about a worker walking out of her job with her head held high after putting her manager in her place. Or a story about some citizen called as a witness before Congress telling those out of touch politicians to pull their heads out of their offices and pay attention to the problems of real folks. Or a story about a long-haired country preacher who tells the governor his marriage is a sham, an act of immorality, and winds up with his head on a plate. Don't we all like a good story about someone standing up and speaking truth to power? I mean, isn't that what this story is from Mark's Gospel? Herod, and there's a lot of Herods, we get them all mixed up. This is one of the Tetrarchs of Judea, one of the three sons of the Christmas Herod, as I like to call him, Herod the Great. He has some sort of puppet-like political power in Judea, and he's married Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And John the Baptist has called him out on this very public and very obvious sin. We're told, beginning in verse 18, John had been telling Herod, so he didn't just do it once. He'd always, every time he saw him, hey, Herod, it's unlawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. Sees him while pumping gas at the gas station. Who pulls up next to him, rolls down the window. Hey, Herod, it's unlawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. This is the thing. And Herodias, the woman, the wife, had a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, was afraid of him, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and protected him. And Herod, we're told, even liked to listen to John when he preached. But John speaks the truth to Herod about the sin of his marrying his brother's wife, who can we just go ahead and say how weird it is, not only that he married his brother's wife, but her name is practically the same as his. I mean, Freud probably had a field day with this guy. So Herod, most likely at the urging of his wife Herod, Ias, Herodias, has John thrown in jail, but not killed, because Herod is sort of intrigued by the things John has to say. Now we know the rest of the story, one, because we read it, but you've probably heard it before, probably seen it acted out, maybe painted on canvas. John's imprisoned, and while he's spending time in his cell, Herod throws a party where his daughter, who is also named Herodias, at least in the text, but in other traditions is called Salome, or what is probably better, the daughter of Herodias, dances for Herod and his guest. And he is so, let's just say, taken by her dancing that he promises her whatever she wants, And so she runs out in the hall, asks Mama, what what should I ask him? Remember, she's got a grudge against John. She says, tell him you want John's head on a platter. And Herod, not wanting to embarrass himself in front of his guests because he made this solemn vow to this little girl after she danced, has John's head cut off and brought in. Therefore, the moral of the story is speaking truth to power is necessary but it's dangerous and could get you killed. That's it. We'll have the invitation now, uh, a benediction, and we can all go home. Do you not believe me? You're a little uncomfortable right now. 
Why? Because that's not what this is, right? That's not all this story is about. If that's all this story is about, John calls Herod out on his apparent sin, winds up dead for his boldness. If that's all there is when it comes to speaking truth to power, then all this is is about how important it is to be right and how you'll be willing to die to prove that you're right. And there is no way that's what this is all about. There's no way that that's what the gospel is all about. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? The gospel. I mean, Mark includes it in his story about the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's why Mark includes it in this story in the first place. Because even though Jesus himself isn't in the story at all about John and Herod and Herodias, it's the very news about Jesus reaching Herod that sparks the man's memory about John. It's the news about Jesus and his gospel that makes Herod begin to, to be afraid, to fear that John himself has come back from the dead, new head and all, to haunt him. This isn't a story about being right and dying just to prove it. This isn't a story about sticking it to the man and winding up being dead for being bold. No. This is a story about speaking truth to power as a way of calling out the very absurdity of power itself, as it's driven by lust, selfishness, sin, and fear. I mean, when John tells Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, John is not revealing something new to Herod. John is stating the letter of the law, the law which Herod no doubt knew before he carried out all the maneuvers required to marry his sister-in-law. So it's not John's identifying Herod's faults that land the preacher in jail. Herod and everyone else, everyone else around already knew what Herod was doing. They already knew it was wrong. No, what lands John in jail and eventually with his head cut off has nothing to do with this pronouncement of sin and everything to do with the embarrassment it brought. With the shame that came with his public proclamation. It wasn't about the truth of the law. It was about the revealing of wrong motivations. The revelation of selfishness and the fear that someone, someone might have found a crack in the king's armor. A crack in the ruler's power. And now others might exploit it. John was killed because he embarrassed Herodias by showing just how limited and foolish our ideas of power really are. Because they couldn't help but be afraid of what John's words might have let loose upon them and their power. See, Herod begins to think John has come back from the dead because Jesus seems to be doing the same thing John did. Revealing the absurdity of power. Turning our ideas of strength on their heads by showing what real power looks like in the strength to resist retaliation and instead offer grace and forgiveness. Herod thinks John has come back from the dead because he hears Jesus doing and teaching some of the same things John did. Because Jesus teaches that real strength, real power, is found not in the ways one is able to execute orders and prisoners at the whim of his dancing daughter, but in the strength it takes to love and pray for our enemies in a way that is just more than religious veneered lip service. Herod thinks John has come back from the dead because like Jesus, John spoke truth to power by revealing that we are all, every single one of us, actually and entirely powerless. Which means we all actually need something. We all actually need each other. That we all need God. That we all need love from one another, without all this petty, meaningless, useless desire to have power over someone else. That's why Herod seems to be haunted by the ghost of John the Baptist. That's why he can't help but think that Jesus is really just John, back from the dead. Because for Herod, John was a symbol of the truth all of us in any position of power eventually come to realize. That we don't have any power 
And we're only, we're only getting by and getting ahead on the collective fear, shame, and selfishness of those around us. We're all too afraid to admit we're weak. All too afraid to admit we need help some days just to walk outside. All too afraid to tell someone we love them. All too afraid to let things go, to look weak, to look stupid, to look wrong, to need someone just to hold us and tell us that we're loved. We're all too afraid. That's what Herod was afraid of when he heard that John might be back from the dead, when he heard Jesus and his word. That's what's really haunting Herod. Not the ghost of John back from the grave to follow him around and point out his mistakes. No, Herod was afraid that John and, of course, Jesus knew what he already knew. That Herod really had nothing. And he was powerless. Just like we all are. You see, speaking truth to power isn't about just some opportunity to make truth claims in the presence of those who need to hear them. Speaking truth to power isn't just about calling out some politician on his or her lies to try to prove that you are more right than someone else. No, speaking truth to power is about speaking the truth that we are all, every single beautiful and broken one of us, really is powerless. That there really isn't a thing we can do by ourselves on our own without it being somehow tainted with the dirt of our own selfishness and sin. Speaking to the truth to power is about admitting that first and foremost to ourselves and understanding that we are powerless, that we need each other, that we need love to give and receive love. Speaking truth to power is about calling out the absurdity of our very ideas of what power is. Because it's not about saying we're right and being willing to die to prove it. That's not the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is about saying that we are loved, that we are all loved, and being willing to die to prove that. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, help us, God, to see that